Welcome back to another episode of Organic Chemistry. I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to talk about ketenes and related rearrangements. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems that we assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, we have a vinyl bromide, and initially this is treated with a borane. So what occurs is a hydroboration reaction. And then this is well set up for a reaction where sodium ethoxide can attack the boron, and this allows one of the R groups to shift and displace the bromide, giving us this new carbon-carbon bond. Now you can still do subsequent chemistry with this boron containing uh, motif, but we're just going to leave it for here. Now in the next problem, we have this boron containing uh, compound, and we also have an azide. And if you recall from last lecture, this looks a lot like that Evans reaction where we form pyrrolidines. Now I recognize in retrospect that it would have been easier if I showed that the boron and the nitrogen were on the same face of the ring. Um, hopefully that wasn't too confusing for you. Now, the other thing is this might be a little bit of a challenging uh, transformation, depending on the ring strain, right? If this was in a chair conformer, it might be okay. Uh, but if it was more of like a boat conformer, it might be a little bit more challenging to do. So essentially, the boron's just going to attack the nitrogen, displacing nitrogen as a leaving group, giving us this N boron containing product. Now, in the final problem, I asked you to show a multi-step synthesis, starting with this bromide, affording this phenol. And so the first way to do this is you could lithiate or make a grignard of the bromide. This could then attack trimethyl borate, which is just like a boron containing electrophile. Um, upon workup, this would be converted to a boronic acid, usually you do a combination of acidic and basic workup. And finally, you could do oxidation with peroxide to give phenol. Now, in the workup, this would be protonated, but like under the current conditions I've just shown here, it would still be a phenoxide. But the assumption is we do workup for all these reactions. Now, one other useful trick is you can take palladium, a uh, catalytic amount, in the presence of B2PIN2, which is just two of these borons connected together. And what you'll be able to do is insert between the carbon-bromine bond with the palladium and then do a reductive elimination with this uh, B-PIN group. And you can instantly just put on a boron with a pinacolate ester right on it. And then you can do the same uh, hydrogen peroxide under base condition cleavage to get the same phenol product. This is just a little bit easier and more practical, especially for our researchers. So this lecture, we're going to talk about ketenes and related rearrangements. So some of the reactions we're going to talk about include the Wolf rearrangement, the ardent einstadt reaction, as well as the frisch buttenberg wiechel rearrangement. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about the Cory fuchs reaction, um, but we're not going to be talking about the Seifert-Gilbert homologation, although this is a really useful reaction, and if you needed to convert an aldehyde to an alkyne, this would probably be the easiest way to do that. It's a little bit easier than the Cory fuchs reaction, but it's uh, one that's worth knowing. It's just uh, due to the length of this lecture as is, I decided it would be worth uh, excluding it. Okay, so first let's talk about the Wolf rearrangement. So traditionally what happens is you can just have like an alpha diazo ketone, and if we draw this in a couple different resonance structures, this is looking a lot like the amide one two shift uh, lecture that we had in the last episode, which I'll include a card to here. And you can see that the R group shifts, displacing nitrogen as a leaving group. And then we get a ketene. A ketene is a bit like an isocyanate or an isothiocyanate, except instead of having a nitrogen here, uh, or here rather, we have a carbon. So a carbon, double bond, carbon, double bond, oxygen. Now these are very, very electrophilic at the carbon, double bond, carbon with the CH. And so, uh, or nucleophilic rather. So this can be a good nucleophile attack the proton and then uh, the hydroxide or another water molecule can attack this pri this position and form a carboxylic acid. Now if you have a certain catalyst such as silver or if you have um, another catalyst such as rhodium or under photochemical conditions what you can do is you can directly convert this to a carbene and the carbene undergoes a rearrangement forming the ketene. Now if you just do this without any uh, catalyst, this will tend to not go through a carbene mechanism. However, a carbene is required if you're using a catalyst. And so you get the same product, it's just a different mechanism. Now some examples of the Wolf rearrangement include the treatment of this steroid derivative with silver acetate as a catalyst. And you can see that this uh, just gives the carboxylic acid on the terminus. In the next example, we have silver benzoate as our catalyst, and 1,4-dioxane and water are used, converting this uh, amino acid derivative into yet another amino acid derivative. Now, a different reaction is the ardent einstadt reaction, Eistert reaction, and what you can do with this is it's essentially like one step before a Wolf rearrangement. So a cool reaction is you can take a carboxylic acid, convert it to an acyl chloride, then the acyl chloride can react with diazomethane, which reacts and displaces the chloride as a leaving group, 
And uh, then once you form this diazoketone product, you can just do a Wolf rearrangement. So the neat trick about this is you start with an acyl chloride, which was derived from a carboxylic acid, and you end up with a carboxylic acid just one carbon longer. So this is a really useful reaction for extending a carbon chain by exactly one carbon unit. And we don't have to use any fancy reductants for any of this. It's literally just diazomethane, add in water. So diazomethane does the job. It's that CH2 just working its way through. Now, a uh, different reaction is the fritsch buddenberg wiechel rearrangement, which is a little bit like the Cory fuchs which we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, in this case, we'll end up with a uh, disubstituted alkyne as our product, also known as an internal alkyne. And so what occurs is either if we have one halide and one hydrogen, a uh, base is going to deprotonate that position. However, if we have two halides, we can lithiate using a uh, base such as n buley which is just going to lithiate that to a, the same kind of intermediate. Then uh, this goes through a carbene intermediate and through a 1-2 shift we're forwarded with our alkyne. Now one example of this that I thought would be cool to include is this, uh, this diiene and this is converted to a triiene. Now if you're ever working with polyenes at all, which can be useful for hexadehydrodiazolders reactions, um, you just have to be careful not to make terminal ions, like polyenes, and that's because they can be explosive. So if you have two alkynes in a row like this with a CH, that could be explosive, which is why the TMS is on there. So it's a good protecting group, and in this case it's protecting us from dying. Okay, now the Cory fuchs reaction is similar, except the overall transformation is you start with an aldehyde, you do a Wittig reaction with carbon tetrabromide, which installs this uh, vinyl dibromide, you can then lithiate uh, like this, and then through a 1-2 shift, you end up with a terminal alkyne. Now you might say, because you're using n buley as a base, that this is just deprotonating this proton, uh, forming an, an alkynal bromide, and then the n buley is reacting with the alkynal bromide. But there's been mechanistic studies done showing that actually the deuterium in this alpha position is converted to the, the deuterium on the final position. So this isn't like an acid-base reaction, because if n buley was deprotonating that deuterium, you just have like monodeuterobutane, and that's not going to be a good enough acid to protonate the final product. So this is a one-two shift process. Now a couple cool examples of this include the treatment of this derivative, which you can see this is derived from a formamide. So they just treat a formamide with uh, Wittig derived from carbon tetrachloride, and then they undergo the Cory Fuchs and they get this cool N alkyne containing compound. Uh, another example includes the formation of trifluoromethyl propyne, which is kind of cool. Uh, and there's one other cool example here where they have a vinyl chloride that doesn't get touched and they make another like polyene, except in this case the alkynes are separated. Now for this lecture I'd like to assign a few practice problems. In this first example I want you to start with indole and convert it to 3 uh, alkynal indole. And it's worth noting that indole is a really good nucleophile and if you were to add an acylating agent such as Vilsmeyer, that's going to add to the 3 position over the 2 position in most cases. Now in this next problem I want you to show what would occur if you treated this alpha diazoketone with silver and then you treated that product with pibop, DMAP, diisopropylethylamine and diethylamine. And in the final problem, I'd like you to show what would occur if you treated acrolein with uh, lithiated phenylacetylene. The product of that reaction is then oxidized by PCC. And then under some set of conditions, you have to end up with this vinyl dichloride, which then undergoes a lithiation reaction, which might do something based on what we just talked about. And then you have to hydrogenate the final compound. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful lecture on ketenes and related rearrangements. It would really help this channel if you left out a like and subscribe. And I hope you have a great day.